Good morning. It's 11th of January 2024 and it's early morning and it's very nicely cooled. <laughs> there, there are some events going on in my family. Anise just got married, another one is getting married and we are having all the follow-up uh, functions in connection with that. So a few hours back, I met with a cousin of mine and he said, you've not been posting a lot. And I said, yes, I have not been. So I thought maybe, uh, you know, I should post a few things once in a while in video format. Uh, because what I have started doing is that of late is that I... Uh, I started putting my thoughts uh, in short format uh, in writing on Twitter. So, you know, Twitter is a very limited format and I limit myself to writing in non-prose. I can't really call it poetry, but uh, fine, whatever anyone wants to call it, but it's not prose. So. Uh, to that extent, it's probably a bit um, inaccessible as well. So I thought maybe, yeah, there are things which I need to discuss. Uh, so I might as well do a little bit of uh, videos as well. So today's video is really about, you know, the, the title is My Uncle and I. So it's really about the differences that I have uh, with one of the very few uh, uncles that uh, are still there, uh, you know, as an umbrella above me. I, I see my elders as an umbrella. <clears throat> so very few are remaining, very few uncles and aunts are remaining. He's one of those to that extent. I. I treasure him and I love him and I like him <sighs> but for him and it's his prerogative uh, he doesn't do any of these so that's okay it's not a problem for me so when he sees me he his BP rises and you know he <clears throat> gets back to the point sorry <clears throat> and the differences that we have really so what are our differences I I think I should make this as today's thought stream uh, it's it's just a matter of two individuals so it should not be important but it's important probably because our difference is really based in our uh, differing philosophies of life and uh, fortunately or unfortunately those have boiled down to the matters of faith so he has a certain interpretation of Islam and I have a certain other interpretation of Islam uh, and these differences date back to when I was in class 10 you know 14 or 15 and uh, yeah, obviously I had to ask questions if they occurred to me. Uh, um, so I did that and some of those are <clears throat> unaskable questions. And as a result of that, I went, my life went in a different direction than his. Or because my life was going in different direction than his. Uh, different questions occurred to me as important to me than did to him. So uh, this is really about our differing takes on Islam. So even though the title of this thought stream is My Uncle and I, it's really about uh, the differing opinions that we have about Islam, my uncle and myself. So, what is the difference and why is it important? Well, f 
for better or for worse, faith is extremely important in human psyche and people have been willing to kill themselves and others uh, for reasons of faith. Uh, now, I find it stupid, but uh, uh, but then I have had to invest far too much of my time and energies in trying to understand life and in trying to make it more objective based uh, than anything else. Today's thought stream will limit to the interpretations of Islam that my uncle and I uh, have uh, have different takes on uh, we have different interpretations so <clears throat> which is the predominant interpretation of islam that um, exists today well uh, and and now you know these are my thoughts right so by definition they are my opinions and because it's a thought stream uh, I will make several mistakes, several factual mistakes, several logical mistakes and I will try to correct them at some point in time uh, but I might not uh, because time really might not give me that permission to do it. So <clears throat> bear with me in this and let's go ahead with it. So the predominant interpretation of Islam today is what can be called as Ashari interpretation. Ashari. 99.99% uh, .99 of Muslims adhere to that interpretation. And um, even though they might not call it Ashari, even though they might think that it's not an interpretation but Islam itself. For anyone who's uh, taken the trouble of uh, reading about Islam's history, written by Muslims for God's sake, uh, they will find that uh, there have been several interpretations of Islam as is true of any ideology. Uh, anything will have a million interpretations, million takes, uh, including uh, factual things, you know. So, uh, now, this is something which I use often, right? Now, different people will have different takes on it even though there's nothing very complicated about it. You, it's just a floss, you know. You just take out a little bit of this thread, you know, and, uh, you know, you break it and you can use it to floss your teeth. <laughs> I'm not going to do that uh, on camera. Uh, but... There can be many interpretations even about this, which is just a simple fact, right? Uh, now, uh, I, I think it was Marcus Aurelius who said that everything that you see, everything that you hear is an opinion, and everything that you see is a perspective, right? So, I think you will um, apologies uh, I got a little distracted so um, I will be putting forward my uh, my opinion my interpretation and obviously people will disagree with it so uh, Unfortunately, for most faithful people, their faith is only one interpretation and that's that interpretation that they hold. It's that opinion 
that interpretation which they hold or the people that they respect hold and you know they hold a regurgitated opinion and regurgitated interpretation of that uh, uh, interpretation and for them that's uh, the truth the truth uh, because to the faithful of islam islam is the only truth and uh, their interpretation is the only islam and therefore the only truth so it's a very potent mix and uh, and uh, uh, it results in a lot of uh, disagreements, a lot of violence. It has happened over the last 1400 years and it continues to happen today. Many people have laid down their own lives and taken other people's lives because of these differences of opinion. Unfortunately, to the faithful, and to the counter faithful as in faithful of a different tradition of a different faith their faiths are really absolute truth and as i have pointed out in many different writings is that there are fundamentally three kinds of truth the first is the subjective truth which a person or a group might hold about, you know, uh, about anything. Uh, that is just an opinion, really. But for that person and for that group, uh, group it is truth. It is a truth that it is actually the truth for them generally subjective truths are held in people's minds like they are the truth so but they're not they are what one sees it as then there are objective truths right so objective truths are things for which you can produce evidence right so my subjective truth might be that there's a you know teacup which is colored pink which is what i used to drink milk when i was a kid and one day it just upped and left to start revolving around the sun in in extremely far out uh, orbit now I can't prove it I can't prove it and nobody can disprove it right because we don't have that kind of technology available that cheaply that we can either prove it or disprove it so I can hold that subjective opinion for me that will be a subjective truth the same way faiths are subjective truths for groups of people now faiths could be about what they might call their religion what they might call uh, claims about truth claims about reality uh, you know uh, claims about history so uh, largely those are which uh, those are opinions which can generally not be disproved or proved. Uh, so those are subjective truths. And then there are objective truths, those uh, which can be uh, proved or disproved. Right? So that mm, meet the criteria of falsifiability by Karl Popper. And uh, that... Uh, might be something like you know I can claim that there's a village called Dhamdusar uh, near Bhopal in Madhya Pradesh, India. Now it can be proved or disproved. You know I I can just 
pick up my car and drive to Dhamdusar or somebody who's claiming it and prove it to somebody who's claiming that there is no village called Dhamdusar in Madhya Pradesh. Um, so those are uh, objective truths. And then there is the absolute truth. Now, absolute truth is what actually exists, right? But since all that we have access to is mind-mediated reality or uh, an image of reality which our mind or, or a video of reality or an experience of reality which our mind presents to us, uh, we can never know what is actually there. So I'm sure um, everyone who's listening to this would be aware of dress gate, you know, that particular dress which seems uh, gold and ivory to some people and which looks uh, blue to others, right? Now, in reality, it can be proved that it is X. But uh, as people see it, to them, it's real that it is this color or that color. And the fact is that we have a particular um, understanding, we have a particular uh, mind-mediated reality which tells us that there is a color gold and there's a color yellow and there's a color green and there's a color blue and there's a color red and so forth. Now all these exist only in our minds because if you ask a dog and if you could ask a dog and if he could answer, he will tell you that no. No such colors exist. There is no color called orange or uh, red or, you know, or whatever. And an eagle uh, will probably uh, tell us uh, there are many more colors than what we actually know. Yeah, because we are, uh, you know, for the want of a better word, we are trichromatic and uh, the dog is bi or dichromatic whatever they they see only two fundamental colors we see three fundamental colors an eagle sees four fundamental colors and so on and so forth so an eagle can also see uh, ultraviolet we can't so excuse me <clears throat> and what color it's a sliver in the electromagnetic spectrum it's just a narrow band and why do we see it because it's in that band that sun uh, emits most of its radiation and because we have evolved on earth we see those colors uh, if we had evolved in a different galaxy or a different solar system uh, where the sun was actually emitting radiation in a different band, we would see something else altogether. And in fact, uh, if you ask a dog, for him, it's his nose which gives him the true understanding of reality, not his eyes as, uh, you know, it is for us. So, uh, similarly, uh, like you can see my video, you can see my image in your mobile phone or your, on your laptop or whatever. It's not as if a version of me is there in that, uh, uh, you know, in that device. Just hang on a sec. So, uh, it's not as if 
uh, uh, that uh, version uh, you know uh, really exists inside that in fact if you were to break open uh, your uh, mobile phone you will not find me anywhere um, so all you will find is something in which some semiconductors in which at some point in time some particular electrons are flowing in a certain way and when they are presented on its screen result in you getting an impression that I am speaking something to you. I am not there inside that, right? So, the third truth, the third type of truth is the absolute truth for which we have no access. All we have access to is a mind-mediated reality which depends on our perceptions and which is our five senses and their extensions uh, which might be able to show us a lot more than they uh, were showing us maybe like a thousand or two thousand years back. So subjective truth, objective truth, absolute truth, no access. By definition this is uh, only personal our real access is only to the objective truth where we can actually prove or disprove things. Most people tend to think that their uh, subjective truth is actually the objective truth. Evidently it is not so. But they believe that very strongly. Actually they have a faith in their subjective reality and therefore it's beyond any possible falsifiability and that's where the problem comes in. Some people will insist upon things in the same way as we may be able to insist upon objective truth, subjective reality which can be proven or disproven. So, uh, you know, an electrical engineer who works on 220 volts devices doesn't really, you know, do, let's say, uh, doesn't really put on a uh, uh, a vest full of bombs and blow up uh, uh, engineers who work on 110 volt uh, devices. We don't because uh, we are able to, uh, you know, work on a certain technology or in, or in a certain field of science uh, where things can be proved or disproved. So we simply talk, prove, disprove, and move on. Uh, in some matters, like for example, electrical engineering, uh, things can be brought to a point where both the sides will generally agree uh, or in some cases agree to disagree and there is no need for uh, for suicide bombers, right? But the moment we move into the arena of subjective truths, nothing is falsifiable there, right? Nothing is really provable there. Because you have faith in something, you believe that you are absolutely right and uh, the other person is absolutely wrong. And therefore, that's where you know, wars begin. You will find that wars really happen over ideas within the arena of subjective truths, such as, for example, socio-economic ideologies, you know, free market or communism, 
So the two forces will fight. Uh, X language or Y language, the two adherents will fight. X country or Y country, the two will fight. X religion or Y religion, both uh, the people will fight. And if you actually look at the history of killings, uh, a huge, huge, huge percentage of all violent, you know, actions or killings uh, um, outside of natural events uh, have been uh, for reasons of faith, you know, faith in communism, faith in your religion, faith in your language, faith in your country, whatever. And uh, the problem is people tend to think that their subjective truth is actually uh, the real reality or the uh, absolute truth. So that is where the difference between uh, my uncle and myself stems. Now, I tend realizing that these are three types of truth and because this is not available to me and this is by my definition by definition just an opinion and therefore can be right or wrong and in terms of actual real reality it is definitely wrong because it's just an in, just an opinion just an interpretation just uh, just a perception that's it so all that we can be limited to all that we are limited to all that we should understand we are limited to is the objective the arena of objective truth and that's where you can sit down put your evidences you can argue and you can uh, prove or disprove the other person so that's where the whole problem is i obviously wasn't able to understand things in these terms when i was 14 but i was asking questions and my uncle, I was asking that of everyone and this particular uncle, he didn't like my questions and eventually, uh, uh, you know, that that difference just snowballed and because my life went in a certain direction because of that belief or maybe I had that belief because uh, my life went in a different direction but be that as it may uh, we had a great difference based on the philosophy of life as i had just explained and uh, this became really a problem because it extended to uh, the interpretation of islam as i had then and as he had then and now. So now we come to the crux of the problem. The problem of varying interpretations of Islam. Now, historically, in certain religions, that is acceptable. So, for example, in Hinduism, it is part, I'm, I'm talking about the real Hinduism, not about the political Hinduism, Hindutva, that is pretending to be Hinduism today or, or uh, that claim that Sanatan Dharm, you know, is, uh, is really X, Y or Z, which is actually basically just a political uh, ideology. Uh, of Hindutva, you can call the religion whatever you want to call it. It, it. It's okay, but the spirit of Hinduism is really in accepting 
humongous any number of variations in interpretation of life in interpretation of faith uh, you know any polytheistic culture whether it is um, uh, hinduism or it is the pre-islamic uh, meccan uh, faith system uh, the polytheistic faith system they are quite open and they are quite accepting. Fine, you consider your God is X, fine. My God is Y, yours is X, fine. That's okay. You pray to your God, I pray to my God, that's it. There is also something incidentally which you find in Quran. But that is in the Meccan verses of Quran. Okay? Uh, when... Uh, Islam was really not in an administrative position as it was in Medina, uh, but in a position where it existed under a different administration, that of that uh, you know, of polytheists, Quraysh, or those that uh, uh, Islamists or or Quran calls kafir. So that's the uh, polytheistic take and polytheism necessarily has to accept others if it wants themselves to be accepted. That's a philosophy, that's a live and let live uh, philosophy, it's, uh, it's the real Vasudhaev Kutumbakam uh, uh, philosophy. Similarly, Jainism. So, Jainism has, you know, uh, the philosophical pillars of Anekantvad, uh, Naivad, and Syadavad. We'll discuss them some, at some other point. But they fundamentally ensure that you understand the limitations of your own faith. That you believe something to be true in terms of faith, in terms of religion or whatever, others need not believe so for this, this and that reason. And both these and largely other Indian faith systems or even uh, Chinese faith systems in, in a measure are open, uh, especially Indian faith systems are open to alternate uh, interpretations, alternate understandings of reality, alternate faiths, as it were. Now, Abrahamic faiths really are not open to that because their fundamental claim is something else. We limit ourselves to Islam at this point in time. Now, what has happened is that over a period of time, I would say um, since about uh, since Al Ghazali, it has uh, become almost a standard. Uh, one particular interpretation has become almost a standard. Almost every Muslim adheres to that standard without even knowing it. That interpretation for 99.99% of Muslims is Islam. It's not even real Islam for them. It is Islam. That's it. Now, historically, that wasn't the case. You know, 12 years, uh, 1200 years back, uh, 1100 years back, there was... Uh, a different there, there were multiple takes on the interpretation of Islam so what is prevalent today is Ashari Islam and by far uh, the person responsible for uh, you know the preponderance of Ashari interpretation is Al Ghazali Prior to Al-Ghazali, there were many 
different interpretations. There was Athari, there was Maturidi, there was Sufi and there was Mutazila. Now today, even those who call them Sufi, themselves Sufi are really uh, Asharis. So uh, and so everything has really coalesced into the Ashari system, Ashari interpretation. Now, but ever since my tenth class, I had become very uncomfortable with some of the Ashari claims. And then I read and I thought and I reflected and. I read Quran, I read Hadith, I read Islamic history written by Muslims and uh, I read Islamic history generally and history generally and I read about other faiths and I have a more refined understanding today which I did not have then. So my uncle, like the 99.99% of Muslims, adhere to the Ashari uh, interpretation of Islam without actually knowing that that's what he does. Uh, for him, Islam is what he believes to be. Why is it a problem? Uh, it's a problem because Ashari system insists now, what happened was that Ashari system uh, sort of brought together with it all the other systems like Athari and uh, Maturidi. The traditional and the literal systems were brought under the umbrella of Ashari system. Uh, Sufi system continued for a while more, but then eventually the the real votaries, the, the real believers of the Sufi system, they di died out and the people uh, that remain are, uh, you know, are, are fundamentally being guided by the Ashari ulema or the religious scholars adhering to the Ashari system. Now, why did this happen? This happened because, uh, you know, Islam, even though uh, we believe that the fundamentals of it were codified soon after the death of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu uh, and from now on, I will not use Sallallahu Islam or, or other, other, etc. All those things I won't use uh, because I'm... I'm talking to a much broader audience than just Muslims. <clears throat> so, um, the last powerful Abbasi Khalifa or Abbasid Caliph, uh, he had a, a manager of his realm, you know, in Game of Thrones language, the hand of the king. Uh, uh, called Nizamul Mulk. His title was Nizamul Mulk. And uh, after that, the situation was such that the uh, the caliphs weren't the real power, even though they were on the throne. There were there were other real powers. So Nizamul Mulk uh, in uh, was uh, running the Islamic realm or caliphate at a time when there was <coughs> a sort of an internal war going on between the various interpretations of Islam and uh, many of the earlier uh, caliphs uh, such as al-Mamun uh, who were really responsible for uh, scientific and scholarly uh, and knowledge-based work in uh, the 
Islamic realm or in the caliphate uh, supported Mutazila. So they supported Mutazila and then there were traditional and literal and Ashari which was slightly more evolved than traditional and literal uh, interpretations of Islam. They had, they were all fighting with each other. And earlier at the time of Al Mamun, the the preponderance was uh, or the power was with the uh, with the Mutazila uh, pe scholars, and uh, the others, uh, specifically Asheris, they were not that powerful but by the time of Nizamul Mulk the tide had turned and because Asheris really stood for Asheris and others stood for much easier interpretations of Islam see Mutazila uh, people were those people who believed that logic and evidence is supreme and in order to interpret anything in Islam, whether it is Quran or Hadith or whatever else, you need to depend upon uh, logic primarily. And since the Caliphs appointed the Mutazila uh, scholars as Muftis, the interpreters of Islam and therefore the deciders of uh, the uh, the the what shall I say, the law. Uh, the law was implemented by the Qazis or Qadis, uh, but uh, it was the Muftis who decided what was uh, right by Islam and what was not. So that's why you hear this word fatwa, because Mufti decides what is right by Islam and what is not. So the requirement at that time uh, Al Mamun onwards for a while was that uh, any Mufti must be a Mutazila scholar. Why? Because when you are not able to decide something based only on Quran or based on only on Quran and Hadith or only on Quran and Hadith and the tradition, then you have to use your own head, right? And uh, that's when you do what is known as ijtihad. You do your own thinking. You 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 use logic, and eventually uh, you are able to come to a solution uh, in terms of how a conundrum is to be decided in public policy or implementation thereof. So, Asharis were much closer to the traditionalists. And at that point in time, Nizamul Mulk, who was very powerful, he sided and actually even his caliph and a few caliphs even before that were siding with uh, the Asharis because, like I said, it's, it's a much easier interpretation to understand than Mutazila because in Mutazila you have to use your own head. That thinking is tough. Uh, following something blindly is easier. So uh, Nizamul Mulk as a manager had to run things. So they, the Caliph and Nizamul Mulk eventually they sided with the uh, Asharis. Now, uh, uh, the, the, what shall I say, the atmosphere at that time was such that these two people were really fighting very hard. Now, today, we will say that no, any group, that sides with the logic and evidence would obviously be right and any group which sides uh, which says that uh, logic and evidence is wrong 
uh, would obviously be wrong. But at that point in time, it was not that clear to people, at least not to the general populace whose uh, support the caliph needed and Nizam al-Mulk needed. So they had begun siding uh, with the Asharis. Unfortunately, uh, the, the, the fight uh, between the two became very, uh, very bitter and it became, uh, it, it started revolving around one particular issue uh, where the Asharis were claiming that uh, Quran or the word of God or uh, Kalamullah that is co-chronological co co-chronological co-existent yeah, co-chronological I would say with uh, God, with Allah so Allah and Quran really are both have both existed forever that uh, the Ashari said that Quran and uh, Allah were uh, sort of were both existent forever that Quran was not created by Allah that it is an uncreated um, book so to say they believe that it's written in on some law Qurani some kind of uh, uh, you know um, some kind of uh, uh, writing pad uh, in the heavens on which it is written and it is it was forever written and uh, Mutazila were saying that no uh, Kalamullah necessarily has to exist after Allah so there has to be a speaker first only then can there be a speech so Quran is created it is created they said it's created by Allah, but it's created after Allah came into being. Now, today, when we sit, we find it very crazy to discuss something which is truly timeless. Right? In the sense, I don't understand how you can think anything unless there is time how you can create anything unless there is time so even if you say that God existed forever and that time time did not exist during that foreverness time did not exist and time started existing at a particular time when God decided to create the heavens and earth. Now, if that were true, then God could not have had any thoughts because any thought, any creation, any intention necessarily requires time because when you there's a point in time at which you don't have an intention and then there's a point in time uh, at which you start having an intention, right? So intention necessarily requires time. So foreverness really is impossible. But there they had that, that great discussion between them. Today we also know by reading history written by Muslim scholars that Quran was actually codified at the time of Abu Bakr and subsequently finalized at the time of Uthman uh, 
द थर्ड कैलिफ राशिदून कैलिफ और खलीफा राशिदून खल तो ही रियली गॉड अ कमेटी टुगेदर विच वॉज हैडेड बाई अ पर्सन हु वॉज देयर इन द प्रीवियस कमेटी विच वॉज इंस्टीट्यूटेड बाई अबू बाकर एट द इंसिस्टेंस ऑफ ओमर हु वॉज द सेकेंड राशिदून कैलिफ and uh, they had written out something and uh, that was available with the daughter of the second rashidun caliph umar uh, that daughter hazrat hafsa was also one of the wives of hazrat muhammad and uh, he called the gentleman who was uh, the head of the committee instituted by the third rashidun caliph usman he was called in uh, uh, that that particular manuscript was called in it was modified as per uh, the 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 uh, whatever fragments and writings that were available with the other sahaba uh, uh, and uh, the people who were ex- who actually were exist who living in the times of hazrat muhammad who saw him who met with him who listened to him and who were uh, who ha- had written down you know they some of them had written down some of the quran who could write others had memorized it so so all those you know all that deliberation was done by uh, uh, by this committee several years after hazrat muhammad was no more and uh, that uh, uh, team came up with a particular official version of quran uh, a bit like uh, the king james version of uh, bible uh, and uh, at least king james allowed the other versions to continue existing hazrat usman actually uh, got everything burnt Uh, he ordered that everywhere in islamic realms all other alternate uh, versions of quran uh, had to be destroyed uh, with the exception of that particular quran which hazrat hafsa had uh, he said destroy everything else so so now we know all that so we know that quran was finalized at a particular point in time if ever there was a law of quran uh, how uh, was why was there a need for something else to be brought down and then finally to be written and codified by hazrat usman why wasn't it codified at the time of hazrat muhammad simple as that uh, so it simply is not logically tenable to claim uh, that uh, quran is uncreated either from the point of either from the angle that time uh, uh, didn't exist at a particular time and that god and quran have been existing since then and that quran didn't need to be actually created it, uh, but it just existed with uh, along with allah from the times before time right whatever that means so um that uh, is oh, one logical reason why ashari claim of quran being timeless or uncreated is really baseless the second reason is of course we have historical uh, evidence to prove that uthman actually uh, got all this done right and uh, the reason the scholars in those times couldn't find uh, alternative versions for was that they were all destroyed and now some versions are coming up elsewhere um but it's 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 quite irrelevant all you need to do is just read quran 
just read Quran. You will, in, in, in a language you understand, and you will find that Quran, uh, as it exists today, is not chronological. On everything, there are multiple takes. Not on everything, on many things there are multiple takes. And today, we don't know which take is the one which is the real final take right so for example uh, muslims consider it really bad to drink alcohol but there are three different uh, orders uh, which you can find in quran uh, which were given at three different points in time all three of them exist in today's quran and because Quran as it is written today is not chronological, it's it's like in a rough uh, uh, what shall I say sequencing in a rough sequencing of uh, larger uh, surahs earlier and smaller surahs later on. That's all it is. In fact, even though there is great agreement in terms of which surahs were brought at, uh, during the Meccan times and which were brought during the Medina times even that uh, separation is not there so you'll find a Medina surah then a Meccan surah then another again Medina surah then again a Meccan surah and why is it important because uh, you know Quran was brought down uh, during 23 years the first 13 of which were when uh, the prophet was living in mecca and the last 10 were when he was living in medina and in the first 10 first 13 the uh, the islamic realm didn't really exist and uh, all the muslims were living under uh, a different uh, regime which was really a polytheistic regime in Mecca and then uh, um, uh, Hazrat Muhammad was invited to Medina which is uh, where he was also the administrative head so there's a complete difference in tone complete difference in matter between Medina and uh, between Mecca and Medina verses Mecca verses are really about uh, reforms and really about philosophy and uh, you know like I said uh, uh, they say that there is no compulsion in religion but you when you go to um, Medina verses they are really the administrative verses and that is where uh, Surah Tawba was brought down which really talks about uh, you know war and killing and so on and so forth on on uh, uh, on the grounds of uh, difference in opinion about religion. So, uh, the Ashari, the fundamental Ashari claim of uh, Quran being uncreated and being co-chronological or co-non-chronological along with God is completely untenable first of all like i said there is this whole issue about um, about what uh, it means to exist without time i don't understand it because if there is no time there can't be a thought if there's no time there cannot be an intention if there is no time there can't be a creation right because you know thought has to begin and become creation has to begin and become right uh, so there has to be time uh, if 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 anything has to be so to me all ashari claims are bunkum so i was on uh, this uh, mutazila line which was really about 
the the prime importance of uh, logic and evidence and not mere tradition which is what uh, ashari islam is all about so so what how does it link to nizam ul mulk so nizam ul mulk was the nizam ul mulk for a very long time you know the guy who was given the title nizam ul mulk he was in that position of running the realm for a very long time and uh, during that time he instituted several reforms and did many good things and he established the first school the first uh, uh, madrasa madrasa is really a school unfortunately today it has become much less than a school where it is only about a certain uh, kind of study uh, but at that time it was really about everything that can be studied um, in that um, uh, this, this was established in baghdad which was the seat of power at that point in time and uh, uh, subsequently there were many branches uh, uh, of uh, madrasas which are opened in other important cities and all these took guidance from uh, the baghdad madrasa and uh, during nizam ul mulk's time uh, he uh, was finding it very difficult to you know get these people together so he found uh, this young man who today we know as al ghazali and he actually at that time or prior to that was a mutazilite he believed in the in the mutazila uh, thought process uh, but eventually he moved to ashari thought process i don't know whether he uh, moved to ashari thought process before nizam ul mulk uh, homed in on him or after that but uh, in either case he uh, became the dean of sort of dean of course work at the uh, baghdad madrasa so he was the one who was instrumental in establishing the curriculum of study for the students of madrasa which was producing scholars so now he came from the mutazila stream which believed in logic and evidence and philosophy and which supported uh, all kinds of translations from greek and latin and sanskrit and uh, which uh, allowed and thought it necessary that a lot of work uh, is required to be done in sciences and in mathematics and uh, from there he moved to the ashari position uh, where he uh, essentially sort of propounded that all philosophy all uh, mathematics is bad these are all works of the devil sort of you know now whether that happened before he was uh, made the dean of course work um, um, uh, you know whether he before he was inducted into the madrasa system by nizamul mulk or after we don't know but we do know that uh, when we w- when he was installed in that position he start he had become or then became ashari uh, possibly and that's a hypothesis possibly because nizamul mulk found it necessary to side uh with the asharis maybe because the caliph wanted it or maybe because uh, he independently thought that the people wanted it or the caliph caliph thought that people wanted it and he can survive and they can survive and the system can survive uh, and the administration can survive only when if they become ashari like either which way uh 
this man ghazali he uh, wrote a famous book called the incoherence of philosophers which really fought against uh, philosophy which was basically greek philosophy at that point in time and uh, he his thesis was really that cotton doesn't burn because there are certain natural laws by which cotton becoming uh, cotton burning becomes you know when you you know uh, uh, throw a piece of cotton in fire it doesn't burn because there are certain laws of nature which require it to burn or certain laws of god which require it to burn but because at every instant in time god decides that it has to burn it has to this piece has to you know the temperature on this piece has to rise by this much and this much and uh, when the the temperature for burning has arrived then it so much of it has to be burned and then so much of it or it has to flash burn or whatever and i'm just putting it in uh, current terminology or or in terms of the terminology i understand um so he was completely anti science and anti mathematics and anti philosophy then when he got into that position so like i said he wrote this book which became very popular the incoherence of philosophers and though a rebuttal was written uh, but it was written too late to be of any use uh, this guy just became too famous his course was became the standard and the funny thing is that was copied all across uh, the the caliphate and all across other islamic realms and other madrasas were opened and all of them followed the coursework which i'm sorry i have to use that word which that idiot um uh, al ghazali had uh, created and and uh, that course work came to be known as uh, dars e nizami the the course work of the nizam or nizam ul mulk and to this day all those boys who reach the stage of scholarly work after they have done half a zai and blah 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 so many other things they are uh, required to undergo that darshan ezami they are still using that as course work al ghazali died in the year 1111 by the common era calendar 1111 AD 1111 CE that's where we are stuck muslims and because all the scholars who are created through the madrasa system they all are schooled in that darse nizami in that course work by al ghazali in that interpretation of islam which is ashari that one in which quran is not created that one in which mathematics and science and philosophy is evil <sighs> what am i to say now so the difference really stems from there that my uncle doesn't believe that i should be using my head coming from the mutazila stream a mufti would have sided with me saying that no you have to use your head you have to use the logic and if with logic and evidence you can prove something to me 
I will make sure that it becomes a part of the Sharia. Unfortunately, Motazela scholars don't exist anymore because they died out, because they had no system of that sort. The only system that existed was that of Al Ghazali, and because he was ex Mutazila, he had very effectively countered uh, the Mutazila arguments that time and had made uh, Ashari system the, the only system, the only interpretation of Islam, uh, even down to the year 2024. And it's still going to last. Probably it's going to last as long as Islam does. Because Islam, in the mind of thinking Muslims, has become coterminous with Ashari interpretation of Islam. So that's where the difference was. So uh, whatever I said was really driven by logic and evidence and, you know, philosophical musings and whatever my uncle believed was really driven by what Mutazila scholars, uh, I'm sorry, what Ashari scholars claimed and still claim today. Now, funny thing is, after a while, um, uh, Al-Ghazali felt that he had started treading a wrong path and his recorded thoughts include the fa uh, the 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 belief that he developed later on that probably a lot of his work at that time while he was the dean of course work at the Baghdad Madrasa was driven by worldly success and the desire to become you know more famous more powerful more accepted whatever he became so upset with himself that he actually disappeared he left his post and went away and for several years he was following a sufi order and subsequently he was found and he was uh, you know prevailed upon to come back to the madrasa and uh, he did push the Sufi narrative for a while, but he had become a prisoner of his own actions. His, uh, I'm pretty sure that if Al-Ghazali were to come back to life and were to live some 40, 50, 60 years in today's world, uh, if he were to come, so to say, uh, in my body uh, and if he were to carry 60 years of my life, I'm pretty sure that he would find that he had made a humongous mistake by pushing Mutazila because Mutazila is downright mindless. Now, many people are going to get, get upset with what I have said right now. And uh, my uncle also got upset. Uh, and, and I'm not going into specifics, really, because we could go into a lot of specifics and we could say this issue, that issue and the other. But fundamentally, uh, the difference is really in the understanding of life, in the philosophy of life that I had and I have. And of course, it's not the same which I had then. It has changed a lot. And what he had, I'm sure his thought process has also changed a lot. But, uh, but yeah, largely, he is into the Ashari tradition, like 99.99% .99 or plus of Muslims and I am in the Mutazila tradition. So that's where I am and it's it's quite irrelevant as to uh, where I stand 
in terms of matter of faiths, uh, lest it might be seen or shown later that I believe in having a faith. Let me state very clearly that I believe that faith is idiotic, Faith having a faith is stupidity, um, because that means that you are against objective truth. Because you will adhere to a faith irrespective of what the objective reality tells you. For I am, am an objective realist because I know I have no access to absolute reality and I don't want to fall in the morass of subjective uh, reality, subjective truth. Uh, I don't know what I said. Let me repeat it. I know that I have no access to the absolute truth or absolute reality. I know that I don't want to fall in the morass of uh, subjective truth or subjective reality or subjective interpretation of that. The only space that is available to me is the objective reality, objective truth, the empirical wisdom. And in that, there is no space for faith. One has to believe in everything in falsifiable terms. Whatever one claims, one must be mindful of Karl Popper's understanding of reality, of science, of truth. We must make our claims falsifiable. Only then will we be able to arrive at a greater absolute truth, a better version of, uh, not absolute, objective truth. Only then we will arrive at a better objective truth, a better objective reality. That's where I'm at. And my uncle hates me for that. So, yeah, what I'm going to have to do is if I come face to face, if I see him in any of the functions, I'll make myself scarce, which is what I always do. Uh, because in the past, uh, whenever I have been face to face with him, which has generally been in 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 uh, or let's say at funerals and such other events and he has found it necessary to launch a tirade against me making that funeral or that function uh, you know um, sort of uh, what shall I say unsavory and I don't want it to happen to any of the functions that are coming up so I'll make myself scarce so that's the part story of my uncle and I and my understanding of reality. Thanks. Bye-bye.